Hey, plus Ultra Fam and Ronin Clan, as well as Pokemon Masters just now finding this series and either of us. Welcome to part 6, the longest and nearly largest in scope of the series Ronin Charizard and I have collaborated on so far. This will be considered the mid-season or season finale special if we were creating the anime, so to speak. So before we start, I want to once again remind members of both communities that they should be sure they have subscribed to both channels with notifications on. Follow us on our various social media platforms in the description below so you can keep up with us and various sneak peeks. And please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. The tournament participants at first needed a moment to really take in Ash's victory before they moved on. He certainly set the tone. The kid didn't inherently have the bearing of an especially skilled or experienced trainer, but after watching him do what he'd just done against Hodge and his mighty looking Hariyama, it was kinda unbelievable he was able to just put it down with a little old Meowth in one move. This was especially true for certain passengers, participants, and the majority of the ship's disguised crew. They'd been shown pictures of Ash, Silver, and Richie in their briefings with the boss beforehand, but none of them really took him seriously when he hailed them as powerful trainers to watch out for and stay out of the way of. Very few of the lower level grunts had heard rumors of the side project that their leader was indulging in along with their current most major project, Project Mew, and when brought up, they'd all laughed off the idea of children being worthy of leading them someday. But now, the concept was beginning to look a lot more possible than any member of Team Rocket originally thought. As for those who knew Ash, their reactions were more mixed. The likes of Brock found himself very proud of Ash. While his strength as a trainer wasn't ever a major pride of his, he did cultivate it to take care of his family, meaning he learned how to get stronger at a young age. He had pretty instinctively tried to help pass that knowledge onto the likes of Ash and Misty, who were around the age of his younger brother Forrest, the second oldest of his family and he had come to really associate them as younger sibling figures in his head. That time alone had definitely had the desired effect and clearly helped to develop some inner strength in Ash, as well as a bit more tact and maturity. Even in the way he won, he could tell that Hariyama would be more than fine after that battle since it was so quick and pretty painless. Misty felt similar, but there was still a burning passion she felt towards Ash that she couldn't seem to clearly express. It was why she needed to battle him. That was the way they both communicated the best. She knew a big part of her feelings were anger and jealousy, obviously. She'd struggled to become a gym leader at their age. Meanwhile, as a kid, he'd naturally gotten scouted by the region's strongest. Misty sometimes had suspicions about how Ash did some of the things that Ash did. And even now, showing up as a champion or growing Meowth into such a powerful Pokemon made those suspicions even stronger. The kid literally never ceased to surprise her. So she could tell there was something else wrapped up in that anger and jealousy. She just wasn't sure what. Gary felt both excited and, if he were to be honest, afraid. It was cathartic to see the Ash with no confidence or gumption he'd met in the beginning of their journeys hadn't stuck around, and that he'd apparently been actively working to make himself a real contender to his surprise. His instinct was to chalk it up to his sheer natural awesomeness, but the sneaking realization of the long-running trend of Ash coming suspiciously close to him in terms of ability and outcome, with less in terms of resources, was not lost on Gary. Sure, his grandpa had begun to try and mentor Ash a bit more after he'd met Giovanni and left the Oak sponsorship, but it wasn't like that alone was enough to cure Ash of being a dweeb and a bit of an airhead. It sometimes made Gary wonder if that meant Ash was somehow naturally being forced to grow faster than Gary in an attempt to make up for those downsides of his. Richie was nothing but pumped after watching Ash's battle. Not only was he now in a position to end his recent losing streak, but he was also set to finally compete against nothing but trainers he knew were to be respected. The likes of AJ looked on at Ash's battle and felt his need for revenge against him for humiliating him grow stronger. He may have been suffering from tunnel vision though, as he was very much convinced that Ash had battled in that way exclusively to rub salt in the wounds that he'd made last time they met. Ash's performance had absolutely enamored Janelle even further than she'd already been with him. He just seemed like an absolute perfect match for her, being her polar opposite whereas she had attempted to take on her training career the slow and safe way by studying and training more intensely than most trainers do in their first few years, she saw Ash as a bit of a maverick who'd somehow drawn the eye of the mysterious Viridian City gym leader with his nearly flawless career as a trainer. It was a part of the reason she'd convinced her classmate Joe from Pokemon Tech to accompany her on a journey so soon after meeting him, as she'd begun to live under the fantasy of Ash as some bad boy running into their school and stealing her heart as he left. Much to Joe's confusion, as he would calmly chime in that absolutely nothing like that had happened. 
Silver, on the other hand, felt nothing. Ash was barely on his radar before he'd battled him, and even after he admittedly pushed him and his team to their limits in their three-on-three -three battle, he didn't think he had what it took to take him down. His focus was on what he suspected to be a cheap ploy to con Giovanni's new protégés into helping Team Rocket capture loads of powerful Pokemon from the trainers who participated, as well as taking them from any regular guests that may have had them. At first, all he had to go by was just his suspicions, and the little bit of information he was able to squeeze out of the Rocket members ordered to tail him. Now, he was well on his way to not only getting to the bottom of his father's current plans, but also his revenge against him. If Giovanni wouldn't treat him as a rightful heir of his criminal empire, then Silver wanted nothing to do with it. It made more sense just to tear it all down and start his own. His participation in the tournament was more than just getting stronger for Silver. It was also about thwarting that scheme. He wouldn't be surprised if his father had already purchased the SSN itself so he could make his own plan go off as smoothly as possible and eliminate any outside interference. It made sense. Why else would this usually small tournament that had never attracted any major turnout or competition before become so ramped up exactly when he, Ash, and Richie all began their journeys? It just added up too easily for him not to notice and decide to participate. It wasn't his duty to inform anyone else of the true nature of the competition. With those thoughts fueling them and their Pokemon, it didn't take the remainder of round one long to get rolling with the bang, as the majority of the trainers ended up pretty much being among the faces in the crowd, all being around as strong or a little weaker than Hodge it seemed. Of note, Ash and Meowth and the crew were firmly shocked to realize that one of those faces in the crowd was familiar, Damien. Charmeleon's original trainer. Then, Ash and Meowth cheered on Jessie as she battled under her ace persona with her Arbok and creamed her opponent. Her travels with James doing basic grunt work and working over fairly weaker trainers than herself had honestly been paying off. And now, more often than not, James and her were more than capable of overwhelming their opponents. Hence why her personal collection of Pokemon had begun to grow decently. It didn't make her any less embarrassed and irritated by Ash and Meowth's antics. And she was certain the cat knew it. It was Richie in the ninth match, and he once again called on Happy to set the tone for his battle and earn his way to the second round. Brock had been paired up with AJ to his surprise, and he tried to lighten the mood by reminding him that he was technically the only member of Ash's little group that he hadn't battled yet. AJ took that as a jab though, and released a slightly smaller than average looking Raticate that Brock suspected was the same one that was used against Misty, and again tried to have a sportsmanlike conduct with AJ by praising it as looking very healthy and well maintained, but he was only asked to get on with the battle in a harsh tone. Remembering his promise to get his team some exercise since their training partners Ash and Misty had been away for the duration of the month, Brock decided not to hold back and started the battle with his golem, who had become more antsy than Onyx had. Again, the Team Rocket members on board were fairly surprised to see the caliber of mark they had on this mission, as they recognized Brock as a former gym leader and one with a fully evolved Pokemon, no less. AJ showed no intimidation, however, as he never really respected the gym challenge as much as he should have, and he and his Rattata took full advantage of the synchronicity its rough training under his Macho Brace equipment gave them. They went all out against their opponent from the start, attempting to overwhelm Brock and Golem with pure speed and power, as right before Brock ordered a rock polish, Golem was sent sliding from a quick attack that had closed the distance between them that looked like it really hurt Golem, and to Brock's surprise, barely seemed to phase Rattata even at its size. Knowing while on the ship, ground type moves really weren't heavily encouraged, since if they were too strong, they could damage and sink the vessel. He instead retaliated with the use of Rock Blast that AJ was smart enough to have his Pokemon dodge, which gave Brock and Golem the time they needed to finish their figment stringer moves. Rock Polish, into Defense Curl, into Rollout. As the massive rock bared down on the rodent, AJ didn't think outside the box, as he recognized that the speed the attack came with wasn't avoidable, so he ordered another quick attack and takedown to challenge the power. To Brock's shock again, Rattata proved itself a tough Pokemon. Even though it was slightly small, it was certainly sturdy and powerful enough as the resulting collision made an almost hard to stomach thud and cracking out of both Pokemon as they blasted each other away from their attacks and slid to a halt right at the edge of their respective side of the battlefield. Golem was definitely starting to feel the side effects of the damage it had taken so far, but Brock knew it could go further easily. Meanwhile, Rattata was definitely beginning to gas out and obviously couldn't continue bashing against their stony defense forever. However, before he could call for Golem to get back into its rollout, AJ kept his foot on the pedal and ordered Rata to rush in again, this time using Super Fang. Though it was exhausted, the small rat nearly disappeared into a streak of light, only to reappear having slammed into Golem's face, with its already massive incisor teeth doubling in length and glowing their own bright white, as the attack caused Golem to suddenly be blown back again, and the Brock's horror knocked out, resulting in AJ just barely inching out the victory here. He would have to get back to letting Golem train with Ash and Misty as soon as he could, he realized. It would also probably be a good idea to participate in more of those training battles alongside it, as Brock realized he could feel their synchronicity slipping a bit during the match. 
Nonetheless, he congratulated AJ with grace and kept his smile up, as now he could go and flirt with the Nurse Joy running the ship's Pokemon Center and use what he'd been taught by Vermilion's Nurse Joy to impress her. The only other match of interest in round one was match 12, in which Silver had been paired up with Cassidy of all people, who simply disguised herself as any old traitor and decided to use her own Raticate during the match. She wasn't very focused on the battle though, as she'd been more so worried about the way Richie had been eyeing her and Butch, and she was beginning to wonder if he was recognizing their faces and realizing they were around more often than they likely should have been for it to be coincidence. It made her a bit more jealous as Jesse and James could skirt by on their half of the mission by letting Meowth do all the up and close observation while they sat back and got stronger from doing their own thieving. She was so wrapped up in these thoughts that when Silver released a large match shot which had a sinister glint in its eyes, she barely had time to order any resistance before Silver and his Pokemon had gone way more overboard than Ash had, and used the strongest bullet punch they could to land a pretty instant KO on the poorly trained Radicate, and worse, send it sailing into the weak psychic barriers hard enough to break through them and go tumbling into Cassidy, knocking them both over in a painful sprawl to further humiliate her while she was down. Silver was fairly sure he'd seen her before and had a strong suspicion she was Team Rocket, so holding back wasn't an option against her in Silver's opinion. Besides, if this really was a tournament set up by Team Rocket, getting disqualified for being unsportsmanlike wasn't really likely. Though Silver did still have to deal with the likes of Ash and Richie berating him for his conduct as he returned his smug looking matchup without a word of thanks to it. Matches 13 through 16 went the way one would expect, with Gary, a disguised Team Rocket manager named Ariana, James, and Giselle all defeating their opponent to move on to round two. The competitors were given a 30 minute break to prepare for the last round of eight matches that day, as some trainers on good terms spent the time discussing their performance with those present they trusted, or even in some cases, like with Hodge, giving their respect and getting to know a bit better the trainers which had defeated them. Giselle spent the entire time trying to hear what Ash thought about her battle, which made him blush and somewhat sugarcoat her admittedly poor performance with her Cubone during the first round, making so Misty couldn't help but sarcastically point out that if her Marowak hadn't evolved, she would have likely gone down like her friend Joe. This state statement caused a good bit of friction between the two, much to Ash's confusion, though his attention was drawn away when he noticed Gary suddenly walked up to Silver and actually get his attention to his surprise. They seemed to speak about something for a while, before Gary finally smirked and walked away as Silver went back to brooding on his own. He also saw Richie currently pestering Jesse, since he currently knew her as one of his friends and was simply expressing his excitement at the chance to battle with her, forcing her to more closely play her part as she wished for this assignment to be over in her head. When the next round was scheduled to begin, Ash went back to stand in front of the screen in the battle room of the ship, because when he'd first seen the name of his opponent, he couldn't help but think it was a pretty cool one. He suddenly got a chill down his spine, as Meowth suddenly and instinctively hissed at someone behind him. He turned to see a tall man with a serious, yet cold smirk on his face staring him down. He kind of reminded him of Giovanni a tiny bit, but he shook the thought off in an attempt to be friendly, and awkwardly extended his hand to introduce himself, and asked if he was Archer. Meowth felt like he recognized this guy, but also realized that the reason he was getting bad vibes off this guy wasn't just because he was definitely Team Rocket but more because he was currently pushing both of their covers unnecessarily by antagonizing Ash. Before he could think on it any further, round two was announced to begin, and Ash simply shrugged off the strange encounter, taking his place across the battlefield adjacent to Archer, who seemingly unfazed by Ash's earlier performance, released his Pokemon first in the form of a rather mean-looking Houndoom that came out with a snarl, snorting flames. Again, Ash had to recognize his admiration for Archer, as the dark fire-type Pokemon was one of the Johto native Pokemon he was most familiar with, and had always always found himself wanting a chance to train. In an effort to get over his small bit of jealousy and to show Archer he wasn't just some kid to be scowled at, he nearly matched his opponent by choosing this as his and Charmeleon's debut. But as if having read his mind, Meowth begins to tug on his pants and gave a gesture as Ash interpreted that Meowth was telling him to go all out against this guy and instead go with Krokoro to teach this guy a lesson. Both options were awfully tempting to him, but with the clock ticking down, he suddenly decided to go with an alternative to satisfy both of their positions as he released Tyrogue. As the battle began, Archer ruthlessly ordered Hound Doom to abuse his long-range attack advantage with a barrage of Ember attacks, instantly putting Tyrogue and Ash on the back foot, where all they could do was waste energy and time running around to dodge the tiny fireballs. Thankfully, speed was something Ash had really helped the little fighting type to develop so far to complement his dynamic power in his small frame, and so it could speed around the attacks fairly easily, even if it didn't like to fight in such an evasive manner. But Archer soon had Hound Doom begin to try and match it by having it switch to using the move Flame Charge causing the canine to speed up as it finally landed a move by slamming into Tyro flame-coated horns first, Archer then had to keep up the assault by having his hound pounce on Tyro to finish it with a bite and then turn the heat up again by converting it into a fire fang. 
To Ash's dismay, he and Tyro continued to have issues getting any momentum going as the bike caused it to flinch and it soon began to cry out in pain, while Archer encouraged Houndoom to keep Tyro pinned and in its fangs until it finally went down. However, Ash noticed a strange blue glow like he'd never seen surrounding Tyro as he began to fight through the pain and was strangely moving a little faster. The battle announcer then recognized this as Tyrogue's ability, Steadfast, which raised his speed after flinching, claiming it as a testament to the fighting type's willpower. However, he declared it may not matter if Ash didn't get out of this hairy situation. Already realizing and recognizing this as a slightly similar situation to when Snorlax had nearly crushed it, Ash told Tyrogue to put all his strength into his legs and use him to push Houndoom off of it. Once again, the Hellhound was fairly slow to react, as it suddenly felt a devastating blow in his gut and would sit flying into the air a bit before clumsily trying to catch itself on his feet. As Tyrogue suddenly flipped back onto its own two feet, obviously exhausted, though with a determined look in its eye. Ash then happily encouraged the scrappy Pokemon, hazarding a guess that he might have just learned Mega Kick. The little fighting type looked at him and gave a small smile and a thumbs up to confirm that he just had. Undeterred, Archer ordered Houndoom to get right back in there by going for another flame charge. But this time, Ash tells Tyro to hold his ground and wait for his signal before unleashing a Mega Kick with all he had left, causing the incognito Team Rocket manager to realize Ash's goal too late as just before his Dark-type Pokemon could slam its flame-covered body into Tyro once again, Ash called out his signal and Tyro pivoted on one foot to move out of Houndoom's view before his now white and glowing foot surged through the fire and flames covering Houndoom to find purchase than fully of all Pokemon's jaw. This hits so hard that Houndoom flies end over end before landing flat on his back with his paws in the air and a stunned expression before passing out, giving Ash the first win as Archer looked on in shock and his young opponent childishly praised his Pokemon, along with Meowth. Growling to himself, Archer released the only other Pokemon he had, as his position in Team Rocket made him marginally above the power and skill of a normal grunt, as his job was simply to command smaller teams of grunts. What made him so angry was that he'd previously seen himself as the strongest and most battle-hardened of the managers, if not even amongst their currently inept admins, and he secretly didn't want to lose to the boss's pet project. Out came his Golbat, who instantly went to flapping its wings, and warming itself up to use its speed, as Ash suddenly tried to recall Tyrogue back to its Pokeball not wanting to push it too far. However, the little fighting type almost instinctively jumped out of the way of the return beam and communicated to his trainer that he wanted to continue, before raising his little arms up above its head and inhaling deep breaths to try and get its second wind faster. While he would have been worried, Ash was sure he could always have Meow swap with Tyrogue if things went poorly, and so he agreed to have the team's warrior spirited rookie overcome its type disadvantage. Golbat was indeed fast, and its size meant that it carried a lot of power behind its wings, allowing it and Archer to score the first substantial blow with the quick wing attack that knocked Tyrogue to the ground. As Archer ordered a leech live to follow up, Ash told Tyrogue to use Mega Kick to escape. However, Archer adapted by ordering Golbat to wrap its wings around Tyrogue and to dig in without letting anything go, no matter what happened. Wrapped in massive wings and no way to escape Golbat's fangs, the scuffle Pokemon could only cry out in pain as its energy was sapped away little by little. It couldn't stretch its short legs enough to use those new Mega Kicks to land any damage and knock the bat away, and all Tyrogue's other moves involved its feet being planted firmly on the ground. Ash had Grimace as he forfeited and returned Tyrogue against its will, and without even having to ask, his partner felt Meowth's weight leap off of his shoulders as his second team member choice for round two was made. Archer was fairly smug about this win. It was certainly possible for him to do Ash's job in the tournament better than the child could. If he were to fail against his elder here and now, he could collect more Pokemon as the mission continued. This could be his chance to rise through Team Rocket's ranks. He used Golbat's mobility and speed again since he knew that Meowth was fast, but likely not as fast as Golbat. If it were to really get going. It was a bet worth taking, he thought. Suddenly though, Ash called for a Swift, the move he and Meowth had decided to start practicing ever since Lugan to Silver's high-flying Murkrow. Misty just so happened to have trained a Starmie and Staryu who knew the attack almost by nature and therefore was a valuable move tutor for the two, making it much easier on them, especially since this was Meowth's first special attack and called for him to summon forth his energy, kind of like Snorlax's Hyper Beam, but to a much lesser degree. The move had two other benefits for them specifically though, number one of which being the discovery that Meowth's ability must have been technician all along. Something Ash would go on to note to the Scratch Cat was actually a pretty highly sought after ability for most Pokemon, Meowth or not, and theorizing this is what Ace Trainer Jesse and James meant about Meowth being special, while Meowth pondered if Technician also had anything to do with his incredible intellect. So while Swift wasn't as powerful as a Hyper Beam by any means, Meowth's ability and normal typing could really beef up the move, causing it to pack a really good punch. And the second reason that Ash and Meowth really loved Swift and decided to make it their go-to long-range attack, it didn't miss. 
As Meowth opened its body up wide and vulnerable to an attack, it suddenly glowed as his normal type energy was exuded and suddenly formed a solid cartoonish looking star of energy much larger than a normal swift attack. In a repeat of the events with Hariyama, in vain, Archer ordered his bat to avoid them by trying to dodge. Something the size of Ash flying at you with that kind of speed was already hard enough to dodge, even if they weren't somehow magically target locked. Inevitably, Golbat fell from the sky after the collision with the stars made a bright explosion of sparkles, resulting in its defeat being called and Ash moving on to the third round. The battle announcer then went on to declare excitedly, Meowth was not only undefeated, but he had also beaten all of his opponents in a single move, making Ash as a favorite to win the competition. This time around, Ash's ability was much less surprising to everyone. The only person to really have any worthwhile reaction was Silver, as he'd also recognized Archer and felt a bit jealous he wasn't being given the opportunity to demolish the eight higher ranked team rocket members he'd identified aboard the ship. In the next match, a trainer named Petrol had been pitted against Damien. When the poor excuse for a Pokemon trainer released his first Pokemon, a Golduck, Petrol released his own with the same lazy, casual attitude he had against Joe. The kind of personality so eccentric you expect the person to either be super powerful or a total poser. However, he used the exact same Pokemon he had against Joe and his Pidgey, a Ditto took to the field and quickly transformed into his opponent. However, it was very quickly revealed that it was not a sufficient match for the real Golduck, as Damien had to use a powerful psychic attack that ended up pretty much decimating the fake. Then, Petrol still holding his lazy and cocky bravado suddenly forfeited as he revealed that Ditto was actually his only Pokemon allowing his opponent to move on to the third round without resistance, and causing Damien to brag to Ash's irritation as he realized he would have to be the one to teach this guy a lesson after all. Misty then faced off against Butch and his primate, this time making a shocking choice herself when she selected her Goldeen to fight on dry land, getting her laughed at before she and her goldfish made it very clear they were not to be taken lightly. As the flopping water type was actually able to jump around the battlefield for dangerous close range attacks like Peck and Horn Attack. This was pretty rewarding for Misty and Golding's hard work and trying to get to the point to be able to accomplish such a feat, as well as having the guts to do so, because just as Primeape and Butch seemed to get a handle on the situation, evolution occurred, leaving the bigger and stronger seeking to eliminate his opponent with a mighty flail, and making Misty's win a very easy one-up of Giselle's former victory. Through the soon-to-be former Rocket admin Shane, he too had to concede the match as he also only had a single Pokemon. Tailing Richie admin Butch and Cassie had little if any time to expand their teams. Thankfully their jobs weren't to win here, but it was still irritating to be surpassed by Jesse and James. Both he and Cassie however felt some catharsis as next up the kid they'd been tailing, Richie, was set to take on Jesse, and they knew how powerful he was, so this would be pretty good payback by proxy. When she attempted to use her Arbok's fully evolved state to hopefully overpower anything that the twerp had, she was directly countered by Richie calling for Happy to use its agility and access to the psychic move Confusion to render that a bad choice. The two grinned happily, hoping that that was Jesse's only Pokemon, but to their dismay, she smirked and mentioned that if her old partner couldn't do it, then Jessie was forced to rely on one of her cute Pokemon she'd been lucky enough to nab as she chose her final team member, a Meowth but a weird looking one to most present. From the sidelines, Meowth felt a bolt of anger at Jesse, blatantly finding him a replacement on the team, as well as the confusion as to why the Meowth looked so different. He did have to admit, it was kinda cute too. Jesse and James during their travels around Kanto had bumped into a relative of a famous professor here in the region from the nearby Alola Islands. Alola had no league or gyms established, and were apparently just now beginning to fully understand the environment's effects on its Pokemon, enough to fully civilize all of its wild areas yet much less from a battle challenge. When she saw what she thought to be a rare regional variant of a Kanto Pokemon, the boss seemed to have a soft spot for, she simply had to snatch it as a gift. And with James's help and a clumsy mistake from their tan victim, Jesse and James were successful in snatching it and one other Pokeball from the man, though she refused to have that other one anywhere near her and pawned it off to James. To her and James's great delight, the naturally mischievous dark type recognized that these two crooks needed a leader to better pull off their schemes. Ever since it and Jesse had teamed up, it had been allowed to do whatever bad things it wanted to, and been rewarded and pampered by its new master, allowing it to learn some moves that Jesse and James' old standard Meowth couldn't. Hence, Jesse decided to give this Meowth the nickname of Mal. With a mixture of the move Taunt locking Happy and only being able to attack, and Mal's small size and own agile speed allowing her to avoid everything the bug did, Happy soon began to tire with each flap of its wings, having to use them for both movement and attacking, and so was left open for Mal to finish it off with a payday, as Jesse cheered and happily ran onto the battlefield to collect the coins which had just knocked out Richie's Pokemon. Slightly disheartened at another loss, Richie decided to take no chances and chose to go with a pure advantage by selecting his own Tyro. Jesse, seeing this, decides to take a page out of Ash's book 
and starts the match off with a fake out, but Richie is ready for this, as he'd had his scuffle Pokemon preemptively use Detect, allowing it to deftly sidestep the speedy normal type attack, and the mouse chagrin come crashing into her back with a powerful tackle attack that sent the Alolan Meowth sliding through the dirt. Jesse then had her use another barrage of coins from Payday, only for them to all glance fairly harmlessly off of his Tyrogue Snipes, as they were actually pelted back at the Dark type from its punches and kicks. At the end of a rope, Jesse called for Mao to use Charm, but even as he blushed a bit, Snipe still charged forth at Richie's behest to deliver a final tackle that rendered Jesse's replacement Scratch Cat unable to battle, and removing another admin from the competition. Deciding to allow his Raticate to break, AJ led off this round with his Beedrill, as Proton used his Zubat. Beedrill was obviously both better trained and equipped for this battle, but after being on the receiving end of Beedrill's Twin Needles and Poison Jab, Zubat was able to suddenly gain a burst of speed as evolutionary energy left it in the Golbat stage, making the battle much more evenly matched, as it could now counter with wing attacks causing both Pokemon to end up taking each other out in the end. Next up, AJ decided he wanted to ensure his victory, so he chose his ace, Sandshrew. After losing to Ash and Sandal, the two had seriously considered evolution, but Sandshrew came to feel very strongly about wanting to maintain its small and agile state. So now, whenever outside training with its own Macho Brace, Sandshrew had been outfitted with an Everstone. Proton, however, had nothing more than a coughing of his own, which proved fairly useless in the face of Sandshrew's speed and ability to masterfully navigate the battlefield, while using rollout with AJ's eyes to guide him, forcing the other undercover team rocket manager to prioritize his mission past this silly facade and order an explosion. When the dust cleared, Sandrew had easily survived the blast by tucking into itself, though it was slammed against the battlefield barriers a tad harshly. It simply flexed as AJ encouraged his starter. Now it's his turn again. Silver eagerly stepped up for his match, only to be met with his opponent, Youngster Larry. As he made it into his box first, Silver also went ahead and released his Pokemon first. Much just like Ash had, the redhead prioritized keeping his team composition close to the chest. And so, once again, similar to both Giovanni's sponsor trainers, he and his fighting type saw themselves easily steamrolling his opponents, fittingly, the last fairly unremarkable trainer of the competition. When the superpower Pokemon rose from its first to its second stage, defeating both opposing Pokemon with overwhelming strength, just as he liked with its finely mastered cross chop, Gary could feel his blood surging. This was the most excited he had been about battles since his journey began, and he thought his first year as a trainer would be interesting when Ash stopped being such a dork. Now, there were all sorts of trainers worth his time to help him climb to be the best. Matching the fire he felt, he decided he needed to end his first day of battles with his honey and released Growlithe. Ariana, who'd been glancing over at Silver as if he had been distracting her, soon cursed herself at her matchup. Deciding the best thing she could do was to chip away at Gary's firewall, so to speak, she sent out her Ekans. But the snake was not only purely outpowered, it was also unsuccessful in causing a poisoning, resulting in her using her final Pokemon, her Gloom. With a Grass-type weakness to exploit, Gary had a clear path to victory, but instead smirked as he returned Growlithe and instead put himself at a disadvantage by revealing another Pokemon. He had an Electabuzz that was noticeably younger than that of Lieutenant Surge. Come on, Gary. Don't go spoiling your team too much. I want it to be a surprise when I whoop your butt. The grandson of Professor Oak heard Ash jeer at him. It made him smile wider, both because it was genuinely nice to have the old Ash back, annoying and loud, but no less caring and talented. What he was saying was for Gary's benefit after all. Whatever, Ash. I've caught so many Pokemon by now, my team could change every round, and I'd still have catches you haven't seen. Ariana wasn't about to sit around and listen to this, and so ordered a sludge, but Gary was on the dime, and countered by having Electabuzz roll out of the way and respond with Discharge, allowing a seamless trade of no damage for big damage. And that pretty much made the fight's trend, as Gary finally had his electric type seemingly juice his powers up even further to overcome their grass type opponent with pure strength. For the final match of round two, ace trainer James faced off with Giselle. He too had expanded his team, but wasn't as gung-ho to use the Alolan Pokemon he'd nabbed as Jesse was. He instead remembered he had some childhood friends he could call on to power himself up for more perilous missions, since even without Meowth, Jesse and James still had their own ambitions. First out was trusty old Weezing, who Giselle decided she would count with the likes of her Graveler. As the battle got underway, James and Weezing went the route of obscuring their opponent's vision with a smoke screen and then a poison gas right off the bat. Surprisingly, even using a double hit to smack Graveler back into the cloud they'd made when Giselle tried to have it rolled out of it. To their surprise though, Giselle now knowing that she was on the clock just coolly claimed that this pesky strategy was meaningless to her before she called for Graveler to use self-destruct. 
The referees maintaining the dinky battlefield safety barriers ordered their Pokemon to soup it up just in time as the walls of the barrier came into view again by containing the explosive attack and the billowing smoke and gas in a box of psychic energy. It wasn't even necessary to wait for the smoke to clear out as both Pokemon were definitely down after that. Following a short intermission to air out the battlefield, Giselle was ordered by the referee to send off her next Pokemon first and she responded by releasing her Marowak this time. James remembered it was a ground type, but wanted to bet that his bond with his Pokemon could see him through it as he released Growlithe, his childhood pet Growlithe. If they were already going around and stealing Pokemon however they pleased, then it made sense to start with a score James was certain to get away with. Stealing Growly out of his parents' mansion was much simpler than he thought it'd be, to the point that he and Jesse joked that Meowth would have probably made that more complicated than it needed to be with some strange contraption or a scheme. When the puppy Pokemon hit the field, it initially wanted to play with James, but just as he'd convinced it that it was battle time, Giselle quickly ordered a Bomerang. As Marowak threw its club, James ordered Growly to dodge, but the puppy Pokemon, still being first and foremost a pet, decided to fetch instead of running face first into Marowak's club, and knocking itself out in the most anticlimactic display possible. The battle announcer had to awkwardly call the end of round two, and thus, the first day of the SSN tournament. James just couldn't believe that he had a more embarrassing match than Biff when he and Jesse had finally been feeling on par with their rivals, while the battle saw Giselle feeling very confident in her own abilities. Joe's sweat dropped as he soon rushed over to Ash and his friends, who had been hanging around the Pokemon Center with Brock and the Nurse Joy riding aboard. Ash was currently being informed by the two that actually the healing machines on the ship seemed to be much older models, so all the Round 1 and Round 2 contestants unfortunately still had Pokemon incapacitated. If the trainers didn't have their own supplies, that meant Tyrogue would have to wait to be healed. So it was very clear to Misty and Brock that Ash was already upset before Giselle came skipping up to him to ask him if he had been impressed with their battle. Misty was actually about to lash out verbally again as she usually would, but her recent growth caused her to hold her tongue. Instead, she mouthed to the other girl to hold off for the moment as she offered Ash a comforting pat on the shoulder and assured him Tyrogue and all of the other Pokemon would be just fine. She didn't want him to try and act tough and brood around the whole night since the next day, she wanted him at full power, reminding him of his promise to put Damien in his place, and the opportunity to face off against her in a real match after Misty had impressed him so much with her growth over the month. It got him to take things a little bit easier. He just couldn't help this impending feeling that something big was about to happen, and it wasn't going to be the good kind of big. After that, he began to interact with Giselle, his other rivals, and friends made throughout the competition. Meanwhile, Misty was forced to step away as the ship attendant had informed her that multiple calls had come for her from the Ceridian gym. She sighed and went off to see what her sisters needed so urgently. Meanwhile, in a secluded staff-only area of the ship, Jesse, James, Butch, and Cassidy had decided to gather up to give Giovanni an update about the SSN mission. However, they found it hard to get a hold of him. Then suddenly the lights in the room turned on, and in came the rocket managers, trailed by a few random people the rocket executives recognized were likely disguised grunts. What are you doing? Don't you know we aren't supposed to contact the boss? Ariana scolded before the executives realizing their rank attempted to reprimand the disrespect, only for Archer to shut them down. Their status as higher-ups had been called into question long before Giovanni had found his twerps. If anything, they all looked down on them, because their ineptitude had set the bar so low for them, the boss now saw fit to replace their ranks with mere children. At that dig though, Jesse gained a bit more resolve, and assured her subordinates that they were still their betters for a reason, as were those silly twerps they'd been looking after. She then fires back that underestimating is a perfect way to overlook rarity. She then ordered James, Cassidy, and Biff to come on so they can start slacking off while the grunts did the work. As the executives leave, Proton growls at being demeaned, but Petrol simply assures him to be patient and reminds him of the saying about good things coming to those who wait. Outside the back entrance to the ship's kitchen the meeting had been taking place in, Silver had been snooping around, hoping to eavesdrop on a little of what was being discussed by the crew. It was already obvious to him that his hypothesis was correct, but what he really wanted to know was what the boss is focusing on right now. He delegates his most important task to the executive or admin class, the second most important task to the manager class, and the least important to the grunt class. So it stood to reason whatever Giovanni himself was working on carried some major implications. Sadly, his father's pawns either didn't know anything or were smart enough to keep their mouths shut because all he'd heard was petty squabbling. To his shock though, he suddenly feels a tap on his shoulder and he instantly goes into self-defense mode, diving out of the way releasing his primary attacker to see what he was up against. The perpetrator was none other than a somewhat embarrassed looking Gary Oak. That's your new starter? The Oak asked as Silver quickly returned his Pokemon. He was definitely more embarrassed and decided to simply walk away. 
However, as he did, he saw Gary's Electabuzz had been released and was currently in front of him, blocking off of his escape. He turned to look at Gary questioningly, as if he couldn't believe that he had been outthought. When Gary returned his ogre, sorry about that, I've been getting a bad feeling, so I decided it'd be best not to walk around the ship alone. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you about something. Silver grimaced and simply made to continue walking away. I'm not about to fraternize with an enemy I'll have to face the next day, he claimed as he disappeared. Man, Ash was right. He does do the whole jerk thing better than me. Gary quipped to himself as he decided to rejoin the group. The next morning, Ash had woken up full of energy, even after keeping Meowth up fairly late to go over the battle strategies for the upcoming double and three-on-three -three he had set for himself that day. He knew he had the perfect combination for baking the big slice of humble pie he wanted to make for his first match. But until he knew if he'd be facing Misty or Richie in the semifinals, his team of three couldn't be fully locked down. He wolfed down the breakfast the ship served and had already taken to his side of the battlefield before the announcers or referees had even joined the rest of the crew. The wait was agonizing to him, and now he regretted allowing Meowth to sleep in. How could he miss this match? Finally, after another 30 minutes, in which not only had the battle announcer come up to Ash and apologized by asking to push the beginning of round 3 back a bit, and Brock and Misty to ask if he wanted to go do something more fun while they waited, he had refused in order to keep his head in the game, as this was a serious battle to him. To his relief, the battle announcer began the festivities by asking Damien to join him on the battlefield, and all non-participating trainers to leave as the safety barriers were formed. The cocky glasses wearing kid mocked Ash standing in the same spot for nearly an hour, like a dork. But Ash merely ignored it. Come on, Meow. You better hurry if you want to watch me kick this kid's butt. Simply enjoying the sound of his own voice, Damien went on to say that he appreciated a poser like Ash being one of his opponents for the tournament. He could tell that the opponents Ash had so far were nothing but pushovers. Not like him. He'd take the whole thing. He didn't know what the grand prize was, but he was definitely taking it. And since Ash had taken the field first, he'd be courteous and give him the opportunity for type advantage as he sent out his first two Pokemon, Magmar and Gold Duck. Ash eyed Magmar and got a sour look on his face as he finally responded to his opponent. Did you get Magmar after you ditched Charmander? Damien cocked an eyebrow and looked at Ash's face more carefully, wondering if maybe he had met him and told him about his wimpy fire type at some point. Assuming that was the case, he confirmed it and mentioned Magmar was much more suitable for a young prodigy trainer like himself. Way better than Charmeleon had been. That's what we want to find out. Charmeleon, Crocorock, I choose you! Ash called for his own picks with as much fanfare as he could as his two rival reptiles took to the battlefield, eyeing their opponents before glancing and storming at each other. Ash then filled them in and reminded Charmeleon this was his chance to show Damien just how wrong he was, pulling Damien into the identity of Ash's fire type and making him laugh hysterically as this was just too perfect. Suddenly, he ordered a water pulse and a flame burst, but Ash was quick on the draw as well and nearly ordered a dig for both his Pokemon to escape through. But remember the move wasn't well suited for the ship, and instead had to resort to more creative means. He called for a stone edge from Croc Rock and told Charmeleon to use the rocks as cover from the water type attack. To his surprise and delight, unlike with Misty, Charmeleon went ahead and listened to him. While it was impressive he learned to counter water type moves with Flamethrower, Ash and Mouth had quickly recognized it was more a waste of energy to show off than anything else. Just getting out of the way was a smarter move, and would keep the battle craving flame Pokemon to the fight longer. And he was sure that working alongside Croc Rock and battling against his former training had something to do with it as well. It was pretty easy to tell that this battle carried more weight for Charmeleon than anyone else. Damien kept his offense up and had Golduck use his confusion to begin crumbling Ash's Stone Edge defense, while Magmar began using Fire Punch to help it do so. They'd back Ash's Pokemon into a corner and pummel them with raw power. Ash's idea exactly. Quickly, he told Charmeleon to destroy the rest of the rocks with Mega Punch and the powerful blow did far more damage than either Golduck or Magmar had been doing to the rocks, and had the added benefit of pelting the two with small shards of rubble and forcing Magmar back. Keeping up his momentum and wanting to let this match be almost a one-on-one -on -one for Charmeleon, Ash asked Croc Rock to assist it in getting in close on Magmar by giving it a boost. His dark type grumbled, but quickly dropped to all fours and yelled for their fire-type teammate to jump off of him. Charmeleon smirks and doesn't hesitate to bolt up Croc Rock's massive tail and plant his foot on his back. Suddenly, Croc Rock dug its claws into the ground and pulled itself into a handstand, sending Charmeleon at Magmar like a heavy flaming rock from a catapult. Damien's fire type recovered before its water type, and so he was forced to counter with Magmar, going for another fire punch to try and use the speed Ash built up against him. Obviously, he couldn't. Mega Punch and Fire Punch clashed with enough power to blow away the dust caused by the crushed rock. But with the support Croc Rock and Ash had given him, Charmeleon was able to outpower the rival fire type that had replaced him, forcing Magmar to lose balance and fall to the ground flat on his back, pinned under Charmeleon. Angry, Magmar lashed out by spitting a fairly weak flame burst from his disadvantaged position, 
and was rewarded by being bathed in Charmeleon's flamethrower. One so hot, Ash couldn't help but smirk as he saw Damien sweating even behind the protective barriers. He tried to have Golduck help Magmar by blasting Charmeleon with a water post while his guard was down. But showing signs of Ash's influence on it, Krakorok put itself between Golduck and Charmeleon and bravely tanked the attack for its teammate by countering it with a Thunder Fang to try and minimize the damage it would have taken. Realizing this had just become a two-on-one, Damien panicked, calling for Golduck to switch over to his confusion attack to keep the unfamiliar creature at bay. But the blue glow that Golduck was able to get to form around Krakorok quickly fizzled out to both Damien and Ash's shock before the young catcher remembered one of the attributes of dark types that Meowth had revealed to him. It was now less rare to encounter Pokemon with the dark typing in the Kanto region in the modern day than it had been when, say, Professor Oak was younger. Just as dragon types like the Dratini Lion were beginning to slowly increase in number in the Kanto region once conservation efforts like the Safari Zone became well established. Ash banks on his fortune and orders Krokorok to charge forward with his Thunder Fang once again, and it finally hits home, allowing Krokorok to chomp square into Golduck's arm used to fend off the attack and begin surging a current into it. As Golduck cried out in pain, Damien arrogantly tried to call out over it in order to fight back, but he was interrupted by the announcer declaring Magmar unable to battle. This caused his focus to shift back as he now saw that Charmeleon's flames had actually become too much for his Magmar which now lay blackened with soot and dazed as Ash's flame Pokemon came charging towards Golduck and Quackrock as the two struggled. At the end of his rope and clearly flustered by Ash, his well-oiled machine was forced to reveal the true colors of the abusive trainer, who could do nothing but vaguely order his Pokemon to find its way out of this blind or else. Even without support or strategy, Damien's duck showed gumption and gritted its teeth before opening its beak to release a point-blank icy wind onto Krokro, landing a critical hit as the ground type's head began to ache. Not to mention, its desert-dwelling reptilian nature made the ice far worse. Since it had no real resistance, it could build to the typing and hadn't had the chance to even start doing so. Reeling back, Krokorok was a tad slow to recover, and the second of hesitation gave Damien the time and confidence to actually give an order, calling for Golduck to capitalize with the Water Pulse, hoping it can get off a of confusion as well. However, Charmeleon had reached them and lashed out with another Mega Punch uncommanded, only for Golduck to react the same way and catch the Fire type with confusion as it unleashed another Icy Wind onto Krokorok, as it apparently viewed Ash's starter as a rightful threat. To Ash's horror, Krokorok was quickly becoming so slowed down as to be immobilized, and was reduced to curling up to maintain warmth, as it couldn't dig down in this situation. Meanwhile, Charmeleon was struggling against its psychic bonds as Damien continued to try and get his partner to follow his orders, but it was done listening if he was. Now, it would fight on its own terms. Charmeleon finally mustered enough power to spit its flamethrower at the water type, but Golduck simply slammed it into the ground, with confusion shrugging it off. Ash looked around just now realizing he could hear some of his friends and other contestants complaining about how the match was growing out of hand, and he recognized the referees were strangely staying silent. Was there something they were seeing that he wasn't? Oh, Charmeleon, I want you to unleash the hottest flamethrower you've ever made right onto Krokorok. Melt the boat if you have to, he called out, and the fire type suddenly understood what he was thinking. No way this would be enough to do in that punk. Reinvigorated, Charmeleon, like in the battle with Erica, belt out a rain of fire that almost seemed out of place for anything that wasn't fully evolved. In this case, actually causing Golduck to end its assault on both and back away, lest it risk being burned. It seemed to finally resync with its trainer as they laughed at Ash's terrible decision, claiming there's no way Krokro could take all that damage just to get warmed up again. However, Charmeleon continued to unleash the flame until its breath ran out and it had to inhale again. The fire burned relentlessly as everyone looked on more enthralled now than with any of Ash's earlier battles. Even he had to admit he may have made a mistake by not taking Damien down when he first came across him. He had given a much larger challenge than Ash had expected, and he had to wonder how many battles badges, if any, the guy had, but he didn't think his starter would care about any of that. He then smirked as he saw exactly what he was looking for, a reptilian silhouette rising in the flame as he called for revenge. Powerfully, Krokorok was able to blow the flame away with the orange fighting type energy steaming off his body, as he angrily dashed to Golduck and sunk his fist into its stomach making the larger water type fold up like a cheap chair and fall to the ground, unconscious just like his partner Magmar. With the battle over, Krokorok snorted one last time as it returned to its side of the battlefield to help Charmeleon up and thank it for its help, though it argued back that it wasn't helping as much as practicing his flamethrower, while casting a final glance at Damien and realizing just how pathetic his former trainer really was somewhat coming to terms with and forgiving his own past mediocrity not really being his own fault. With Ash and Krokorok and even Missy to push him, Charmeleon had truly become strong. 
Ash thanked his partners and returned them as he left the battlefield, only to find that Meowth was currently curled up in Misty's lap with his belly full. Ash snatches him up by the scruff of his neck and storms off to their cabin to berate the lazy Pokemon for missing such an important battle. What's the matter, kid? You won because of the strategy we came up with, right? Meowth attempted to argue, but Ash corrected that technically their plan fell apart pretty quickly when Golduck took the field. It made him realize the Psyduck that Misty was currently raising could one day end up being a pretty formidable opponent, even though it was the dopiest Pokemon he'd ever seen. Meowth then reminded him that Richie and Misty were battling next, and Ash quickly ran out of his cabin and back to the battle viewing area just in time to see Richie being given the first choice of Pokemon, and subsequently Misty the first move. For this round's double battle, Richie made almost the exact same choice as Ash when he chose to call on Dune and Foxy. Ash cheering the two were great choices since they actually directly covered each other's weaknesses. Meanwhile, Misty's choice was a fairly risky one as she decided to lean on two of her newest Pokemon, calling on her newly gifted Lotad and a shoulder that Ash had no idea she was in possession of. The shellfish Pokemon was fairly stationary and lazy, while Lotad was currently scuttling around excitedly as if it were already being attacked and trying to dodge. As the battle commenced, Misty had Shoulder go for a yawn on Dune and asked for Lotad to use a water gun on Richie's Vulpix, but Richie countered by having Foxy roast over Shoulder with her flamethrower, burning his yawn before it reached Dune, while Dune was told to let off a dragon breath to counter Lotad's water gun resulting in the two Pokemon clashing for a second before the Dragon-type attack easily won out, as not only was Dune a bit stronger, Lotad had already given up on his water gun in favor of moving towards Dune and suddenly jumping up to smack into him for an unordered astonish. Dune was hit hard by the Ghost-type move and struggled to maintain his flight for a moment, causing Lotad to laugh as he began to glow with evolutionary energy, causing Missy to call out to Ash to give her the rundown of this next stage, since she was still pretty unfamiliar with the Lotad line, something she'd have never done before their month apart. Ash quickly pulled out his Pokédex as Richie and his teammates also hurried off to allow the short intermission in battle, while Missy's new Lombre began to dance around happily. With the battle back on, Foxy continued to focus her attacks on Shelter as Doom began to overwhelm Lombre because of his inability to move at the same speed. However, due to a miscalculation on Richie's part, Doom dodged leaving the attack meant for him to strike its teammate, allowing Misty and Lombre to land a Mega Drain of the Fire-type. And while it didn't hurt too badly on its own, it did give Shoulder an opening for payback as it unleashed a full power water gun which ended up knocking Foxy out after she'd been blasted against the barrier walls, leaving Dune in a one on two. Now having to dodge two sets of long range attacks, Dune was doing its best but Lombre was again able to hit another critical shot and celebrated by dancing again as Dune, now soaked with water and down, was left open for Shoulder to blast with an ice beam causing Frost to quickly begin to cover and freeze Richie's starter as it cried out in tremendous pain. Suddenly, the Vibrava froze over in a massive block of ice, and Richie panicked, calling out to Doom. The battle announcer began to state Richie's loss and Misty is moving on, when the ice began to glow similar to Lombre's light, but far brighter. And then, the ice around Doom burst away to reveal the Dragon-type having evolved into its final form, as the now mighty Flygon shook the battle barriers with the force of its cry alone making Misty realize this wasn't going to be so simple, as she afforded Richie the same courtesy that he did towards her earlier, by allowing him to celebrate and scan his starter with his Pokédex. With Pokémon and Trainer both eager to test out their new strength, Cerulean's strongest was now on the back foot, as Richie ordered Dune out in full force, while Lombre and Shelder, in a panic began to lose focus on Misty's commands and saw the shellfish withdrawing into its shell, with more speed than Misty had ever seen from the creature. Meanwhile, Lombre simply began running around frantically as Dune decided to hone in on him, and to Richie's shock, instead of the usual speed boost from a quick attack, he saw his partner now shrouded in an indigo dragonic energy. At a frightening speed, it slammed into the ship floor, right where Lombre had been just a split second beforehand, as Richie again had to check his decks to recognize Dune had learned a new move. Dragon Rush. Still shaken, but refusing to give up or leave her Pokemon on their own due to her incompetence, Misty suddenly called out to Lombre to ask it to grab Shelter so it wasn't left out in the open. Lombre suddenly stopped its panicking and looked back at its trainer in confusion, allowing Misty to realize that it had been likely just acting as if it were scared by Flygon, making her rather irritated, though she had to hold that back and continue to help her Pokemon. With her anger now channeled into authority, she snapped at Lombre to get serious and help Shelter by carrying it. Lombre suddenly shivered in fear of its new trainer, and hopped to do exactly as told, diving towards the still withdrawn shellfish and placing it in its lily pad, as Flygon and Richie were once again ready and on the attack. 
as Richie ordered his partner's bug buzz, hoping the type advantage sound based attack would get Lombre out of their way. It was a good idea as Lombre instantly dropped to its knees, clutching its head in pain and nearly dropping Shelter, who Misty could see was also quivering under its shell from the force of the attack. Desperate and remembering Shelter's attacks had been the only effective ones, Misty was reduced to a last ditch effort and ordered Lombre to throw Shelter at Flygon. The mischievous grass and water type obeyed and grabbed its new friend from its head before lobbing it through Bug Buzz at the exact moment it finally fainted from all the damage. Shelter continued to stay withdrawn until Misty encouraged it to not be afraid and to fight until the end with an ice beam, with all the power it could muster. Dune's eyes widened behind their goggle-like covers, and soon, all he could see was the freezing energy beam as the next thing it and everyone else knew, Richie's starter had been knocked out with a critical hit. Misty was the one moving on to face Ash in the semifinals. Richie, however, didn't seem to be too upset about this outcome, and instead was too proud of Dune's evolution and tenacity in battle. It wasn't lost on him that he had begun to develop a bit of a losing streak, but it also wasn't lost on him that those failures were lessons, which led to this achievement, giving him a bit of a confidence boost rather than reducing it. Misty came and shook Richie's hand, admitting she honestly should have lost that battle, and probably would have if Shoulder wasn't such a good defensive wall. Richie countered that she battled really well, and that he expected little else from one of Ash's companions. He really hoped to battle her again one day, which she agreed to, blushing a tad under his praise, before focusing back in on her next opponent, Ash, who she looked to in the crowd, only to notice him now frowning at her and Richie strangely. Was he jealous because they got to battle, or for some other reason? Before she could dwell on it too long, she was snapped out of her thoughts by two angry voices calling for her and Richie to leave the battlefield, as Silver and AJ had already taken their places and were very unhappy for the delay. To the crowd's surprise, the two young trainers were completely silent as they released their respective team members for the double battle. AJ began with his Sandshrew and Beedrill, while Silver chose his Machoke and Murkrow. As soon as the battle was called to begin, both Stoic trainers got right to it. AJ ordered his Pokemon to gang up on Machoke first with Sand Attack and Poison Jab, hoping to blind Silver powerhouse and hoping to leave it with the status effect but silver shut that plan down with two simple commands bullet punch and assurance. Before his two Pokemon could even cross the field, Machoke was on AJ's side, having just blasted Beedrill with an iron-fisted punch that sent it bouncing off the battlefield barriers, but still conscious. That is, until Murkrow came dropping down from the air above, driving its feet into Beedrill's back as it forced it to the ground, this time definitively rendering it unable to battle. AJ was shocked, but not stunned, ordering Sanshu to get revenge on Murkrow with a Crush Claw, but the Machoke simply caught the attack before it could hit his teammate its new larger form making its earlier sinister smirks as a matchup look like innocent grins in comparison. Sanshu in a panic used defense curl to hide from its opponents, only for Madchoke to cruelly force it to expose its belly at Silver's orders, allowing Murkrow to wail on it with a wail of blows until AJ finally recalled his partner while literally quivering with anger. The battle announcer was about to declare Silver's semi-finalist position when AJ let out a bellow of primal rage that brought the entire event to a screeching halt. He now saw himself as unable of getting simple payback against one person. The battle announcer awkwardly stated that a small delay was going to be held as a few preparations were made, but that Gary and Giselle could go ahead and take their positions. Misty, Ash, and Brock found themselves feeling a severe sense of guilt. Ash could more than remember the way he spoke to AJ the last time he had seen him, and it was clear the guy had changed for the worse since they had last met. The trio had agreed to go and try and find the other boy for Ash to apologize and to see if they could make him feel any better. But just before they made it into the room, the battle announcer excitedly came back into the room with two crew members wheeling a table with a cloth covering its contents. Once again, we apologize for the delay. We needed just a little bit more time to prepare the first place winner's prize. The announcer nodded to the disguised grunts who removed the cloth to reveal four items on the table. Two of them were boxes with what looked like to be old regular empty Pokeballs. The announcer revealed these as a shared pride for fourth and third. Second place would receive a marginally better prize in the form of a higher grade capture device, a set of three great balls, and a single shiny Ultra Ball. First place, however, seemed to get everyone's attention, and sadly even took Ash's attention off of his earlier guilt at the prospect of having a shot at it. As you can see, our SSN tournament champion will be walking away with the ultimate prize, a Pokemon egg. And I assure you, what hatches from this egg is much rarer than you can imagine as it is guaranteed to be a Pokemon you cannot find anywhere in Kanto or its surrounding regions. Of course, the Rockets had no intention of actually awarding any of these prizes. All they needed to do was keep everyone motivated and fighting hard enough to put their Pokemon in the ship's care center. 
With that, Gary and Giselle needed little else in the way of a prompt to send out their Pokemon for the last match of the day. Gary once again revealing Pokemon he had in his possession unnecessarily, as his choices were his starter Pokemon, and now having fully evolved into a Blastoise and a Rhydon. Giselle seemed caught off guard by the powerhouses in front of her, and puffed her cheeks out revealing she didn't want to show off her newest secret weapon until she got to face Ash again, since it was meant to be a surprise that she'd gone all the way to Fuchsia City Safari Zone to get her hands on it. Her choices for the double battle were her Graveler and a Kangaskhan she bragged would make an amazing nanny to her and someone's children, while winking towards Ash in the crowd and making him turn beet red. Something the creature surprisingly grunted confidently about as Gary looked on, pretty shocked that such a cute girl had any interest in his dorky rival. The battle was announced to begin, and Gary wasted no time by instantly ordering both of his partners to speed themselves up with rock polish and rapid spin respectively, even showing incredible tactical prowess by having Rhydon stand directly behind Blastoise high speed acting as protection for the dual type as Giselle showed her time as Pokétech's top student wasn't wasted as she matched his rock and ground type speed up with her own and sent Kangaskhan in for a mega kick as she had to jump over Blastoise and stomp down on it with everything it had. This choice being one that caused the ship to shake harder than ever before due to the combined weight of the two Pokemon. However, behind its shell, Blastoise tanked the attack extremely well, only having its spinning stopped and more importantly, leaving its partner a great opportunity to attack Kangaskhan with a massive drill run. But Giselle again showed her battle prowess by having Kangaskhan use Mega Punch to catch the attack, then having her heave Rhydon's weight up with immense strength as his baby tried to help by reaching to hit Rhydon before she completed her suplex by flinging it behind her as Graveler completed the combo by slamming a glowing arm into the flying Rhydon for a super effective hammer arm that smacked the creature back into Gary's pinned down Blastoise. After Kangaskhan jumped off of it and masterfully landed next to Graveler, looking at their hard work as their trainer cackled, seeing her scheme come together so perfectly. To her and her Pokemon chagrin though, Gary began to chuckle along with them as both Blastoise and much more surprisingly, Rhydon got back up to their fiend as if nothing had happened. They just now seemed interested in the battle as Gary ordered only two moves, a Hydro Pump from Blastoise aimed directly at Graveler who slammed into the battle barriers with enough force making Giselle flinch and cover her face, remembering seeing Cassidy bowled over by her own Raticate earlier. That moment of hesitation leaving her Kangaskhan without a second pair of eyes to react when Rhydon suddenly appeared in front of it with speed too immense for anything its size, whether buffed or not, as it showed the normal type what a real hammer arm felt like, actually dropping the massive creature to the ground with a thud, as the blow was more than enough force to KO the creature, bringing the third round of the second day of the tournament to an end. The announcer began hyping up the finals for tomorrow, as they were set to have the greatest battles yet the next day. Giselle shamefully returned her teammates, and similar to AJ, felt a ridiculous amount of embarrassment, as all her bragging to Ash and his friends now came to the forefront of her mind and caused her witches hope invisible. Meanwhile, Gary had walked up to his Pokemon to congratulate them on a great win though he playfully chastised Rhydon as he felt it was a little too rough on a female Pokemon, and a mother at that. The massive creature grunted and hugged his trainer tightly, now scolding him for his own bad habit of thinking she was a male, as Blastoise looked on with a smirk. Giselle then wasted no time getting her Pokemon to nurse joy before making a beeline to her cabin and slamming the door behind her. Once again, Ash and Brock felt some concern for someone they considered at the very least an acquaintance, while Missy bristled at their being able to remember a crying person only when it's a cute girl, to which they vehemently denied getting the group into a completely unrelated conversation and taking their minds off it. Now thinking about it though, Ash still wanted to try and make amends with AJ, and he really wanted to give Silver a piece of his mind for his ruthless battle style against the guy. But from the little time he'd spent around him, he had come to realize Giovanni's kid was way too hard-headed to just listen to words. The only way Silver was going to change his ways was if someone beat him fair and square and showed him that aggression and cruelty weren't enough to take him very far. And after Gary's previous showing, he had a small amount of hope his old rival could do the task for, thus allowing Ash and Gary the chance to hopefully settle their own score. The rest of the night went fairly uneventful, as the contestants and the guests enjoyed a meal and a few of the ship's attractions. Brock called Vermilion City's Nurse Joy to ask her to endorse him in front of the ship's nurse, so that way he'd be allowed to treat all the injured Pokemon. As of now, she'd only apparently gotten through a little over half of her patients that were admitted during the first day, and would have to work through the night to deal with a surplus of new ones before tomorrow's matches. AJ had even finally gotten his emotion under control enough to show his face and admit his Pokemon to the Pokemon Center before, like Giselle, retiring 
into his room and even threatening Nash when he tried to speak with him, making Nash's guilt and remorse sour back into nothing but a bad outlook on the other boy. Richie had still been obsessing over Dune's evolution, even going as far as to leave him out of the Pokeball to both help him get used to his new form and so Richie and his friends could keep marveling over the dragon type. This caused Misty to remember a strange look that Ash had on his face earlier when she and Richie befriended one another. However, when asked about it, Ash honestly couldn't remember the facial expressions he had and simply blamed the misunderstanding on his eagerness to battle, making him a little grumpy, to which she quit. She'd make sure his fighting spirit was more than satisfied tomorrow, as she decided to turn in for the night, wanting to be at her absolute best. Something Ash appreciated and decided to reciprocate, as he and Meowth retired to their own cabin, and didn't even bother attempting to strategize their team composition for the three-on-three -three against their traveling companion and rival. The next morning, Ash had once again woken up far earlier than he usually would, and was easily able to get Meowth up once he was reminded that the best food on the ship was always served at the beginning of the meals. To his great pleasure, Misty was already awake and waiting for him at the ship's Pokemon Center, while she chatted with an absolutely exhausted looking Brock, trying to convince him to go and grab a nap before the tournament started. He joined them and agreed with their redheaded friend, as Nurse Joy concurred and thanked Brock for his help, as she had gotten nearly caught up and could finish the rest by herself. That way he could actually relieve her of duty for a bit and allow her to break once he's had some time to rest. Finally convincing Peter's former gym leader, who ended up not even having enough energy to make it back to his own cabin, and thus had to be deposited in ashes by his young companions, passing out on his bed fully clothed and drooling into ashes sheets much to his chagrin. Just then, the battle announcer could be heard getting the gathering crowd excited as the semifinals were almost ready to begin. The two friends looked at one another and bumped fists before leaving Brock to rest in the cabin and returning to the battle area, to a chorus of cheering from the spectators who had been thoroughly enthralled with their performance so far. The announcer began the round with introductions now up to date with a bit more information on the competitors, like Missy's gym leader status and Ash's Viridian City sponsorship, as well as reminding the spectators that the semifinals would be three on three, while the finals would be a hybrid double battle. Turn two on two when one trainer's duo of Pokemon were rendered unable to battle. As he says that, many of the disguised Team Rocket members in the room tense, as today is the day that their scheme had to go off without a hitch. With that, the battle between Ash and Misty was set to begin. The two friends eyed each other before Ash made a gesture alerting Misty to his allowing her to choose her Pokemon second and take the first move, as he ended up releasing his newly caught Poliwag. Misty would have been irritated by his choice as she saw it as his not taking her seriously, though she quickly wisened to the possibility he always could have snuck in some training with his recent team member. She wouldn't underestimate Ash or any of his Pokemon, as she'd seen the results of all those who'd done so before her with her own eyes. Her choice was going to be Squirtle, to match him pure water type for pure water type, when suddenly one of her Pokeballs burst open to reveal her Psyduck. She stared in shock while one of her eyes twitched in annoyance. The dopey creature looked around, confused at the situation, but it was too late, as the announcer declared the first match of the semifinals would be Ash and Poliwag versus Misty and her mistake. With no other option, Misty simply clenched her fist and breathed deeply to attempt to keep her head clear. She then ordered Psyduck to get in close and attack with a scratch, to which the creature tilts its head awkwardly, wasting an inordinate amount of time at which Ash has both ample time to call for a countermeasure and realize there was no need to, as Psyduck hadn't moved yet. Confused, Misty asked what the issue was, still trying to maintain her calm, when the duck finally seemed to comprehend before waddling up to Poliwag as quickly as it could and taking a weak swipe at his face. This seemed to irritate the tadpole more than anything, and Ash, though feeling bad about having to capitalize on Missy's misfortune, ordered his Pokemon to retaliate with a body slam. Something Poliwag did with gusto, as its blow made Psyduck look even wimpier as it was sent flying backwards towards Misty. She tried to keep encouraging it, but next thing she knew, a light from Ash's side of the field came and went, leaving a Poliwhirl in his wake, as Ash congratulated his new catch, having not realized it was so close to his next form when he caught it. However, his good mood was soiled when Psyduck was disqualified after it adamantly refused to battle any longer and beat on the barrier separating it and Misty with tears in his eyes until she finally returned it with her face redder than Ash had ever seen before. He wasn't surprised when her next Pokemon ended up being her ace, and as soon as it was on the field, Misty called for an immediate Thunderbolt from Starmie. Ash attempted to counter by asking Poliwhirl to try and interrupt the attack with a water gun, but to his horror, the creature seemed as if it had no idea what he was talking about and simply crossed its arms in front of its body like a fighter for protection, obviously resulting in a very short match as it was knocked out by the super effective blow in the next instant thus tying the two companions back up with two Pokemon each. Now a bit peeved off himself, Ash asked Misty if she felt any better, but she responded that she couldn't until she beat him. Then looking to his partner on his shoulder, since he knew most of his team weren't the best matchup for Misty's strongest, Meowth grunted a bit but didn't hesitate to prepare itself for the battle when suddenly, Misty switched out to Squirtle revealing her last Pokemon, as she wanted to keep Starmie as fresh as possible for Ash's last Pokemon, since she was taking no chances with this battle. The third battle got underway at once, with Ash calling for a fake slash and Misty perfectly preempting it 
by having Squirtle withdraw into its shell and punish Meowth with a point-blank water gun to the face after his claws gouged deep marks on his prized shield, knocking the feline away. More so pissing Meowth off than hurting him, as Ash ordered him to retaliate with Swift, exactly what Misty seemed to be waiting to bait out from her friend, as she instantly orders Squirtle's mirror coat. The tiny turtle withdrew again, but this time as a shimmering coat of energy enveloped it, and seemed to make it impervious to the massive stars barreling down on it, which seemed to almost absorb into Squirtle, before being spat back out with double the size, power, and speed they had been sent with. Knowing they couldn't dodge them, Ash and Meowth charged right in with the cat extending its claws to make use of its slash, as he jumped and weaved past his own attack, having to cut the stars into two to get them a to effectively stop approaching him, finally allowing it to get in close on Squirtle and land another slash on its shell. This time, when Squirtle tried to blast Meowth, the cat took a move from Giselle's playbook and jumped on top of Squirtle, something it regretted immediately as Misty ordered her own rapid spin, and Meowth was nowhere near as heavy as Kangaskhan, resulting in it being spun at high speeds and flung off against the battle barriers. It quickly climbed back to its feet, but Ash called him back, stating this was pretty clear a stalemate for them, and that they'd have to rely on their secret weapon. Meowth nodded and ran back to his trainer's shoulder, as Ash's Everstone Sporting Oddish took to the field with pride and confidence, bouncing around excitedly as it wanted to dazzle the crowd. Misty revealed she knew she'd see it in this battle, but that she'd prepare for it and ordered Squirtle to use an ice beam like Shelter taught it. However, only a bit of cool air escaped from the turtle's mouth as it failed to reproduce the attack and left itself open for Ash and Oddish to use a Mega Drain, allowing for a simple and clean knockout, as Misty had to bring Starmie back out. And as soon as she did, she had it use Light Screen to make Oddish's long distance grass moves far weaker. Ash and Oddish, however, seemed undeterred, as if that's how Misty thought she was going to win, then she had another thing coming, since that would only slow them down. She agreed, but reminded Ash, both their Pokemon had secondary typings, and her side held the advantage there, as she ordered Starmie to strike back with a Psy Wave. Oddish cried out in surprise and pain, as Starmie's gem glowed, and it was picked up by a faint blue psychic aura, and slammed around. Ash growled and called out for his encouragement to Oddish, but nothing he said seemed to be able to get through to her or the pain, and it was obvious that to both both him and Meowth, the weed Pokemon couldn't last much longer. Beyond that, Meowth wasn't the most confident in its ability to deal with the psychic type, so he had been betting that Oddish's grass moves would be their ticket back to a win. A sense of desperation and panic began to grip Meowth's heart. Their orders were to win the tournament, so to it, failure was not an option. If they failed their first mission, he and Ash could end up as the same kind of jokes to Giovanni that he'd been along with Jesse and James. He couldn't allow that, wouldn't. Though the thought pained his heart, he knew exactly what he had to do. As Oddish's vision began to blur, she suddenly began to feel energized out of nowhere, to the point that Starmie started to struggle to maintain its hold on her. She didn't know what this was, but she wasn't complaining about it, as she could finally hear Ash calling to fight back with the Mega Drain. However, when she did begin to pull on the Starfish's life energy, she felt the pull become much stronger, as it did when she evolved the Herb Zorb. This was Giga Drain, and it felt great to sap Starmie of its strength after its torture. Misty and Starmie, however, continued to fight back, until Ash this time ordered her to use Pretty Poison to escape its psychic hold. It did so, but felt both the force of its spin much stronger and the amount of poison that it produced much higher. Starmie had to retreat at Misty's orders, and as soon as it did, Ash noticed the shimmering wall in front of it finally fade away, allowing he and his partner the opening they need to fire off the strongest moonblast they could right into Starmie's gym, resulting in it taking a critical hit and wobbling on his feet before finally flopping on its back as the light from its gym dimmed. Elated, the grass type quickly ran to her trainer for praise, only to realize that Ash had a very awkward smile on his face as he knelt down and asked her to keep calm. She noticed that Meowth wouldn't look at her either, when Ash took her hand and told her everything would be fine. And A chilling realization came over the newly evolved Gloom, as she became distinctly aware of all the eyes on her, and shamefully tried to hide behind her trainer to conceal her new appearance. As she did so, she finally noticed the small stone that had been fashioned into a headband for her to keep this very thing from happening, now lying at Meow's feet, and the tears in her eyes began to pour as she begged to know why her friend would do this to her. Ash couldn't bear to hear her sobs almost as much as Meowth could, and so returned her while fixing his scratch cap with a glare. He would have rather lost to Misty 100 times over than make one of their teammates so sad to win. You're unbelievable. He grunted to it as Meowth retook his place on the field with his head hung a bit low. He didn't think having Ash outright upset with him would feel so wrong. Misty clutched Darmy's Pokeball as she returned it, before looking to Ash and Meowth's expressions and feeling a supreme amount of sadness even deeper than that of someone knowing their loss was at hand. This was beginning to be a rather dark day for their group, and she didn't like it. This entire battle hadn't gone the way she'd hoped. To Ash's shock and horror, his friend made the decision to end the battle before he could, 
raising our hand and forfeiting the match as the announcer proclaimed Ash's finalist position. It was truly the most hollow victory he'd ever had. Misty gave him a soft smile as she approached him and patted his shoulder before stating she was going to go check on Brock, but would definitely be there to watch the finals. As she left, every instinct Ash had was begging him to drag her back and take the entire tournament hostage just so they could finish their match the right way, but he knew his friend wouldn't want that. And once again, his gaze fell to Meowth and hardened before the scratch cat quickly looked away from its trainer in shame. Gary came strolling up behind him and patted the same shoulder that Misty had, stating everyone had off days, but reminding him that he expected nothing less than Ash's best when he faced him, so he orders Ash to go get his affairs in order. The other palette native nods solemnly, even though Gary had spoken down to him a bit before glancing to him and asking a favor. He wanted him to give Silver a serious attitude adjustment, something which made Gary smirk and state that he didn't need to be asked to do that. The red-headed boy in question took to the other side of the field and Ash and Meowth left to head towards the Pokemon Center. Ferris wanted to get Poliwhirl checked in with Nurse Joy, and since Meowth and Gloom were mostly fine, that would thankfully be his only other Pokemon down for the moment. Once he reached her, he could hear the announcer begin to introduce his rivals, as Nurse Joy thankfully was able to give him some good news. Firstly, it seemed that Starmie's Thunderbolt had been calibrated to simply knock Poliwhirl out instantly instead of doing any long-lasting damage. A simple potion in a Paralysis Hill was enough to have the water type revived, though Nurse Joy advised him to allow it to rest for the remainder of the day. Secondly, she was happy to reveal that Tyrogue was back at 100% thanks to Brock's help and returned to Ash, making him lighten up a bit, enough to ask Meowth to do a bit of translating for him and Poliwhirl in private. Though the cold tone he'd asked the cat and include me off into his not being back to being happy-go-lucky by any means. Back on the field, Gary declared that he wanted Silver to have both the type advantage and the first move. As he released a familiar face, Rhydon took the field with a mighty roar. You're predictable, Oak, Silver said as he smirked and released Machoke. Right back at you, Gary replied as he waited for Silver's first move. A bullet punch was what he expected and is what he got as Machoke's bulk crossed the field at a high speed and allowed it to bury its steely fist in a Rhydon's hard belly. Gary ordered her to hang tough and use scary face. The ground type nodded and fixed Machoke with an intimidating glare, which the fighting type tried to match even though it felt a little unsettled. Something didn't seem right. Silver, however, ordered a cross chop, but Gary quickly countered by ordering a double hammer arm to intercept and another scary face to top it off. Machoke felt that impending sense of doom once again, but when it tried to look back and call out to its trainer, Silver sternly told it to stay focused and dropped the heavy Pokemon with a low sweep instead, this time allowing another successful blow and also toppling Rhydon onto her back, only for Gary to once again call for for another scary face. Silver at this point began to be clued in that something was up, but Gary's trap had been sprung when he chose Machoke in the first place. As Gary then ordered Rhydon to grab Machoke's foot with its tail and trip it, it did so before popping itself back to its feet quickly, before heeding Gary's next order, Horn Drill. It began to spin its most dangerous weapon at high speed, just as Machoke sluggishly started to reach to its feet, and was left wide open when it came slamming its drill into the other Pokemon's back, resulting in Machoke being blown forward towards Silver's barrier, while spinning violently, already knocked out unconscious before it slammed into it. You're pathetic, he growled to himself before he returned Machoke, but Gary heard him and called him out. Nuh-uh, you don't get to do that. Your Machoke is a natural born battler. It knew something was going on even before you, so you're the pathetic one, Gary said. Silver was about to bark at him to shut his mouth, when the memory of the concern he had seen in Machoke's eyes unnerved him a bit, since it was always such a confident creature. Gary was right. He had to hold his tongue and simply continue on, carefully considering Considering his next choice, Silver decided not to hold back, lest he risk another loss, and sent out the Pokemon he caught at the Pokemon Tower after being dragged to Lavender Town by Richie for his rematch against Mr. Fuji, his haunter. The ghost took to the field with a cackle, but Silver ordered him to be serious and focus on the battle causing Haunter to frown and do so. As Gary and Rhydon prepared to deal with them, they were blindsided as Haunter suddenly disappeared, only to re-emerge in Silver's order of Ice Punch for once again fading away and continuing this pattern, until it was clear to Gary that Rhydon wasn't going to be fast enough to win this one, so he returned it, conceding that matchup to Silver. However, he wouldn't lose to a guy who could barely even connect with his Pokemon, and out next for him was another Pokemon he hadn't used yet, as well as one he'd formed a very strong bond with in the form of his Eevee. Silver scoffed at the terrible choice, but Gary remained confident, even when Haunter disappeared again. Gary simply told Eevee to wait for his scene. The little normal type did so faithfully, and it was clear relaxed and held complete trust in his trainer. Gary had his eyes sharp and focused all over the field, waiting for any hints of the color purple, and as soon as the light traveled back to his eyes to show set color, he instantly ordered Eevee to charge forward with a quick attack. 
which caused Evie to sail harmlessly through Haunter, who couldn't help but laugh at the seemingly useless move. Instead of heeding Silver's order for a sludge bomb, and thus left itself wide open when Gary's Evie quickly jumped and spun around as Gary called for a shadow ball which, to Silver's horror, slammed face first into his unprepared ghost type and exploded with a potent oomph. Hunter then fell to the ground in a heap and was returned to his Pokeball even before the referees could declare it unable to battle. Silver once again has to withdraw another broken tool in shame before declaring this charade ended here as he releases Ace, for Ralligator. Gary whistles, impressed with the creature, before thanking his Eevee and returning it as he decided to match Silver by sending out Blastoids once again. The two water starters eyed one another with interest before their trainers both called for them to fire off a Hydro Pump with the two attacks clashing and still made it with equal power. However, Silver was quick to double up and ordered his Gator to use an Aqua Jet to get in close on Blastoids, though Gary was ready with an order for Rapid Spin causing Feraligator to slam into the hard shell and be deflected back. Silver ruthlessly ordered Feraligator to get back to his feet and drag Blastoise out of that shell so he could slash it. The gargantuan Gator then obediently tried, actually shocking both Gary and Blastoise when he was able to stop Blastoise's spinning with a single claw with only a bit of strain. Meanwhile, it plunged his other hand inside the shell to attempt to grab the tortoise's head, only to have its hand bitten, causing it to cry out and nearly back away if not for Silver cruelly ordering it to not be a wimp and keep pulling. Gritting his fangs, Feraligator was actually able to do so with the grip on Blastoise's beak as he used his brute strength to force Blastoise to expose its head. And as soon as it did, Silver had his partner rain down on its skull with as many uses of slash and ice punch as it could muster before Blastoise finally found the strength to tuck his head back in again, giving Gary an idea as he asked his friend to turn the match around with the skull bash now. Much to Feraligator's shock, as it tried to reach in again, Blastoise suddenly went on the offensive and barreled its heavy armored body into its much softer and vulnerable one, for a pretty hefty amount of damage that set Feraligator sliding onto its back panting hard. It didn't even need Silver to threaten it before it burst back to its feet with one last gasp of energy, as a watery orb began to leak off of it and its eyes narrowed to slits. Exactly what Silver wanted, as he ordered a Torrent Enhanced Aqua Jet this one coming about twice as fast as the first one and generating a copious volume of water as Gary and Blastoise looked on in horror at the powered up attack barreling towards them. Meanwhile, after finishing his talk with Poliwhirl, Ash had been hard at work looking for Misty, first having went to his cabin to find no Misty but a still sleeping Brock with a now alarmingly large patch of drool on his sheets. Though he had no time to dwell on that, and he went to check his companion's cabin only to find no response at the door. Confused, Ash wondered where she could be when he heard a loud boom from the battle taking place in the ballroom below them. He wanted to witness the battle, but this was more important. Desperate, he released Charmeleon since he had been informed it apparently had a decent sense of smell and asked it to find Misty for him. The fire type seemed confused, but began tracking nonetheless. When it finally stopped leading Ash to their next destination, he was a bit shocked to find himself in front of Giselle's cabin, which still had a Do Not Disturb sign on it. However, if Misty was there, he had to speak with her, and so went ahead and knocked, only to hear the solemn voice of Giselle telling Joe or whatever team member of the crew that was ignoring her sign, but Ash awkwardly announced his presence, and mentioned he was aware that Misty was in there with her. Almost instantly, he could hear the door's lock being undone, as it cracked open to reveal Giselle's cute face rather close to his own. She didn't have her usual light makeup applied, but still had enough inherent beauty to cause him to blush and stammer as she clued him into the fact that Misty wasn't in a great mood and had retreated to her cabin for a little girl talk and relaxation, but she was willing to come and hang with him if he needed. Though, before Ash had the chance to turn the offer down, Giselle cried out as her ear was being tugged by the fiery redhead, and she was forced to move out of the way as Misty quickly stepped outside, accidentally bumping into Ash and painfully smacking their foreheads together. To Charmeleon's delight as he began to laugh hysterically beside Side Meowth, who still seemed rather subdued. Misty then shut the door behind her, much to the displeasure of Giselle, as she beat on it from the other side, calling for Misty, as she said she thought they'd become friends. While rubbing her head, she asked Charmeleon to keep Giselle in there for a little bit, while she and Ash went to speak in private. Meowth decided it'd probably be best if it stayed with it while they did. The two exited the cabin area and were greeted by the afternoon light and the ocean breeze, as they came to lean against the railing and sat silently for a bit. The two simultaneously apologized for such a weird battle before Chuck apart. Ash then asked how come she ended up adding Psyduck back to her team. When she sighs and reveals that her sister called her a few days after she'd caught it and begged her to take it with her since it was such a hassle to take care of. He couldn't help but laugh at himself having guessed that something along those lines had happened after being regaled of the many tales of the Waterflower sister's antics. When she glared at him, he quickly changed the subject by asking if she noticed that earlier when Poliwhirl couldn't produce a water gun, which got her to tighten up as she was a bit curious about it. He smiles and ends up 
releasing two of the Pokemon in Poliwhirl and Tyrogue. The two looked curiously at each other, and the two humans, before Ash asked the two if they thought they could do him a favor and have a small, friendly spar. No moves, just physical power and fighting skill. Tyrogue seemed willing, but doubtful that Poliwhirl could do so at his level, as he'd grown up sparring with his brother, parents, and the karate master, as well as his students. But to his surprise, Poliwhirl actually mirrored him when he bowed, and began pretty skillfully blocking and countering his attacks and coaxed it to do the same, as Misty looked on intrigued, but confused, until Ash explained. Poliwhirl didn't know any water-type attacks whatsoever. Even thinking back to the Krabby they'd seen in defeat, Misty realized it had only really used Body Slam the entire time. Still pretty confused, she asked why Ash was showing her this while he turned to her, allowing the two Pokemon to continue obviously enjoying their spar. He then produced his Pokédex and began scrolling through it as he elaborated that because Poliwhirl was such a natural-born fighter, it revealed to him that of the two forms available to its species, it felt most drawn to that of a Poliwrath. Finally finding said creature's dex entry, he handed the device to Misty who began to investigate the information it had on the creature. As Ash continued that this meant Poliwhirl was one day going to need some pretty special training to make use of its primary typing, lest it ran the risk of squandering its full potential. So he had an offer for her. Misty then looked up at Ash as he grinned and asked if she would be willing to trade her Psyduck for his Poliwhirl. She balked at the foolish question and assured him that she'd be more than willing to help train Poliwhirl. Psyduck wasn't by any means a fair trade for it. However, Ash to her surprise calmly holds her hand and expressed that it wasn't about fairness, it was about doing what was right for their Pokemon, and he had a feeling that he could help Psyduck instead of forcing Misty into possibly releasing it or neglecting it, while she could end up being vital in Poliwhirl's growth. He also had to admit that Damien's Golduck had given him a newfound appreciation for the species, so it wasn't as if it was a completely selfless endeavor. Misty's eyes grew shiny with tears as her face heated up. Ash had definitely matured about as much as she had, and she couldn't help the large grin that now split her face or the lunch she made from to wrap him in a hug and thank him for such a kind act, as she gracefully accepted and he chuckled returning the hug before the two knelt down to speak with Poliwhirl and Tyrogue as the two had paused their spar to watch the human's antics. Misty then released Psyduck so we could hear their plan as well. While Poliwhirl seemed open to the idea, especially since it'd still be around Ash anyway, Psyduck vehemently refused and turned his back on Ash. But Misty asked it sweetly to at least try it out for a little while. With a blush of its own now, the duck agreed and Ash smiled as he thanked Tyroke and encouraged the gang to all follow him to the ballroom since there was also an onboard trade machine right next to the battle area. Not to mention they should probably also free Giselle. However, he was told not to bother as said girl arrived with the now well-rested Brock, Charmeleon, and Meowth who seemed to be in a bit better mood seeing Ash and Misty deal with their tension so easily. Brock thanked his two friends for convincing him to sleep while Ash told him not to mention it and that they'd be swapping cabins, since he's pretty much claimed his bed now. However, Giselle heard them along, announcing that the finals were meant to be starting very soon, and Ash would be disqualified if he were to be late. Just now remembering the other semifinal battle, Ash quickly asked who won, to which Brock revealed that Gary had successfully defeated Silver, even though he heard it was a pretty close battle in the end. They'd even extended the break between the semis and finals a bit so Gary could have any Pokemon he wanted to use fixed up. And speaking of that caused Brock to bolt off to go and relieve Nurse Joy of duty so that she could go and get some rest herself. With that, Ash ended up returning Charmeleon and leading his two friends and the Pokemon that were out of their balls back to the ballroom, where Gary and many of the spectators were still celebrating his win. Ash scanned the room for Silver, but he was nowhere to be found. Even when he looked to Richie and mouthed the question of their compatriot's location, the boy could only shrug as he too was unaware. Focusing back to his current goal though, Ash and Misty made their way to the trade machine and said a small goodbye to their companions before returning them and placing them on their respective sides of the machine. With the flash, the two Pokemon swapped places and their new trainer released them to welcome them to their side of the team. Misty received a dutiful salute from Poliwhirl, while Ash was met with a roll of the eyes from Psyduck as Meowth looked on. He had a strong feeling that he and this guy wouldn't get along. With that done, the two returned their newest team members and smiled to each other before Misty once again thanked Ash and actually went as far as to place a small pet on his cheek before she wished him luck in the finals and ended up dragging the other girl with her to go get it something to eat. You two are definitely getting along better, Meowth suddenly and quietly quipped as it clambered back to Ash's shoulders, but as soon as he reached his favorite perch, his trainer had grabbed him by a scruff and set him back down in front of him while fixing him with a steely gaze. He was still very upset with Meowth and his actions and told him that when the tournament was over, he expected it to do everything it possibly could to make up with Gloom. Meowth hung his head and nodded as Ash acknowledged his remorse and continued on to his next order of business, getting to a video phone so he could have Fear return to the team. 
He'd hoped to update Giovanni as well, but when the call finally went through, it was actually one of the man's assistants instead. Thankfully, the woman who picked up was able to get Firo and send her to him though, and he decides to send Gloom back to the Viridian Gym, since he doubted she'd want to be in such a crowded place while she wasn't used to her new form or appearance yet. Since the first part of his next match would be another double battle, he decided it'd be best to go with a four-man squad of Kakarok, Firo, Tyrogue, and Charmeleon. He and Psyduck were going to take a lot of work to find some synchronicity, and he honestly didn't have any desire to battle alongside Meowth at the moment. Just as he thought that, it was announced that the finals would be starting soon, and caused him to make his way back to the battlefield as he could feel his excitement and anticipation rising back to the levels they'd reached that morning. He and Meowth decided to sit quietly and wait for Gary to arrive and for the match to begin. After about five more minutes, which allowed Ash to clear his mind and relax, Gary had taken his place across from him in the battle announcer, as the two Pallet Town natives were introduced for a final time, as well as their battle records in the tournament. Even given the number of badges both boys had obtained, though Ash tried to ignore Gary's six to his three. But after that, the battle was in their hands. To Ash's surprise, Gary congratulated him on making it this far, but stated that he hoped the guy would be satisfied with second best, while Ash simply smirked and quipped back that he was just about to say the same thing, causing the two to share a laugh before their faces turned deadly serious. And then they both sent out their team members for the double battle. For Ash, a team of Croc Rock and Firo, and for Gary, a team of Blastoise and Electabuzz. With no time to waste, Ash ordered his team members to start off the way they usually would by calling for Croc Rock to back up Firo as he called for her to use an agility. But something was wrong, as Firo instantly squawked at him and turned to face him, beating its wings angrily. This causes Ash and Meow's eyes to widen in disbelief, as a single look into the bird's eyes alerted them to a major problem. That wasn't Ash's Firo. Just as they realized Gary called out that he expected Ash to get this thing under control by now and offered to give it an attitude adjustment as well, he ordered Electabuzz to fry it with a Thunderbolt while ordering Blastoise to pinch that ice type weakness of Crocoroaks that Damien had exposed. Ash still feeling panicked tried to order Crocoroak to intercept the electricity, but it moved just a flash too quick and ended up slamming into the still angry and confused Firo, which fell to a single attack in a heat. Thankfully, the movement allowed it to dodge past Blastoise's bright blue freezing energy beam as Ash recalled Firo and began to breathe frantically, feeling a pinch on his leg and looking down toward Meowth, who extended his claws to center his trainer. Though they weren't on the best of terms right now, he was still Ash's partner, and he refused to give up on his mission. Ash nodded before looking back at Crocroak just in the nick of time to see Blastoise firing a giant beam of water at him. On instinct, he called for his first Pokemon to defend itself with Stone Edge. Crocroak fearlessly did so, causing large, jagged rocks encased in light to begin surging towards Blastoise, and split its Hydro pump down the center before slamming it into its chin and shell, causing it to skid back a bit, obviously stunned by the unsuspecting blow. Gary retaliated, having Electabuzz charge forward with its own use of Cross Chop, but Ash simply used a revenge-powered punch, which shattered the row of stones, which pelted the Electro-type with even smaller shards of stone, and keeping it back as Electabuzz was forced to guard. By the time the hail of stones ended, the ogre tried to glare at its opponent, but Ash had already ordered it to charge forward with the crunch, but to its surprise, Krokrok somehow encased its entire body with its dark type energy before slamming violently into Electabuzz to the point that the creature painfully flipped head over heels landing face first and obviously unconscious causing the added benefit of a moxie activate. As the announcer updated the match to have become a one on one Ash began digging through his pocket for his Pokedex but Gary had already chimed in that he was fairly sure Crocroak had learned the move foul play and even congratulated them on it but even so ordered another ice beam from Blastoise which Crocroak needed no instruction to dodge, remembering the pain of Golduck's attack earlier and wanting no part of anything like it from something as strong as the current opponent. However, his large tail was the last thing to move out of the way of the beam, and ended up freezing to the floor, causing Crocorook to trip and fall while trying to tug itself free. Gary and his starter whooped, as now Ash and his were sitting ducks. And knowing it'd be most effective to continue fighting from a distance, he ordered Blastoise to give him a hydro pump with all it had. Just as Croc Rock began using revenge at Ash's order to shatter the ice around it, by the time the two refocused on the enemy, the pillars of water were already bearing down on Croc Rock. And knowing there was no escape now, Ash ordered Croc Rock to do the best it could to block its body from the force while biting into the water with Thunderfang. Though the ground type was hit hard and forced back and slammed against the barrier, Ash and Meowth could see him hanging tough and chomping into the water, causing a surge of electricity to travel through it at high speed and cause Blastoise to writhe in pain. This even seen Croc Rock and Ash get lucky and seemingly cause a paralysis on Blastoise. 
The two Pokemon then glared at each other from opposite ends of the battlefield, while water still dripped off of Krokorok's tired and bruised frame as Blastoise seemed to twitch as residual joints of electricity pestered it. At the end of the ropes, though, the starter Pokemon fall forward nearly unconscious, as both young trainers call for their starters to hold tough, and in an unprecedented upset, Krokorok reaches its hands forward and catches itself before passing out of the ground. Blastoise, however, thuts to it, unable to battle any longer. Gary curses while Ash cheers. But before the two could continue into what they thought would be the next portion of their match, a loud boom was heard, which shook the ship from below. And suddenly, a disturbing amount of spectators and crew members of the ship in the room threw their disguises away to reveal black jumpsuits emblazoned with bright red R's. But this is where our story leaves off for right now. Well, we hope you all enjoyed this massive addition to this narrative. As always, the usual YouTube stuff of asking you guys to be sure you subscribe to both me, Plus Ultraman, and Ronin Charizard to make sure you don't miss the next installment of this series or our other content. Remember, when it comes to this collaboration, we alternate every other part. Odd parts on Ronin's channel, and even parts on mine. So be sure you also hit the notification bell, the like button as well, and comment your thoughts on the story so far, as well as your predictions for what happens next. And as for you amazing patrons of the channel, I hope you all won't mind a simple credit scroll for the end of this already massive video. With all that said, however, our time together has come to an end. So as always, take care of yourselves and the world around you. Be sure to remember trans rights are human rights, black lives matter, and that I love you. And as always, go beyond plus ultra. And I'll see you guys next time.